I'm going to ask you to take your Bible, if you will, now and turn with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John, not the Gospel of John, the first epistle of John. And um, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, three epistles that, that come near the end of the New Testament, just before the book of the Revelation. 1st John, Jude is in, in between 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation. 1st John chapter 1, and wants to read the first four verses, and that will be our text for this morning. 1st John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. John the Apostle writes, and he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For life was manifested, and we have seen it, and, and bear witness, <clears throat> and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen, and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. I want to talk to you about that last phrase. We're going to look at all those verses again, but I want to talk to you about that last phrase that your joy may be full. Joy comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have personal copies of your word that we can read and understand. Lord, speak to us by your spirit and through your word in this hour. Lord, we need to hear from you. As we just heard in song, Lord, we do need you. And we pray again that you touch each of us according to our needs. And Lord, save the soul who doesn't know you today, either present here or perhaps listening online or someone who will be listening later. Father, just pray for those souls. And we pray for the Christians here, the believers, that you'll strengthen our faith, that you'll help us to have the joy that you desire for us to have and to center our thinking upon you that we may have both joy and peace. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. In 1970, Gordon Jensen wrote a song titled Redemption Draweth Nigh. And in 1970, it seemed a, a great deal like the world conditions seemed like the Lord might be coming soon. A few years after that, 1975, I heard a speaker <clears throat> speaking on the subject of the Lord's return, and he was talking about uh, events that were current at that time in, in 75. And I asked him after he spoke, after the service was over, I asked him, I said, I know no man knows the day or the hour when the Lord will return, but according to your studies, how long do you think we've got? And he was not quick to answer. He said, I don't want to be pegged as a date setter. I fully appreciate that because people who set dates for the Lord's return are almost always wrong. They are always wrong until the Lord comes. But the fact of the matter is, so many have set dates, and, and one famous group had set 1914. Well, that certainly didn't happen. And others have named different things. There was a fellow who <clears throat> wrote a book a couple decades ago titled 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Come in 1988. Well, obviously that didn't happen. And so... People don't want to be, as this man said, pegged as a date setter because you're almost certain to be proved wrong. Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. If no man knows the day or the hour, then anybody who says, I know, I figured it out, is obviously going to be wrong. But this man said, I, I don't want to be pegged as a date setter. But looking at the way things are right now, remember this is 1975, Looking at the way things are in the world right now, I don't see how it could be much past 1980. Well, can I share something with you? It is much past 1980. And he didn't, he would never have stated that publicly. Again, he didn't want to be pegged as a date setter. But circumstances in the 1970s certainly looked ripe for the Lord's return, and they certainly look that way today, and I think even more so. One thing we do know, 
whenever the time of the Lord's return is, and I cannot tell you when that's going to be, but we are closer to it than we've ever been. That much is for sure. That song was sung at a time when many Christians were looking for the Lord's return. But I want to read you the words of that song. It's not, not very long. And I'm going to reverse the order of it. In other words, I'm going to do the second verse first and then the first verse. And I have reason for doing that. But just listen carefully, if you will, and see if this second verse doesn't sound like our time today. And it sounded like 1970 also. Second verse of that song says this, Wars and strife on every hand, and violence fills our land. Does that sound like today? Yeah, it sounded like 1972. Also, not 1972, but you could put that one in there also. Wars and strife on every hand, and violence fills our land. Still some people doubt he'll ever come again. But the word of God is true. He'll redeem his chosen few. Don't lose hope. Soon Christ Jesus will descend. The chorus says signs of the times are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. Turn your eyes upon the eastern sky. Lift up your heads. Redemption draweth nigh. The first verse says years and time, years of time have come and gone since I first Heard it told how Jesus would come again. That's true for me. Years of time have come and gone since I first heard it told how Jesus would come again. I never heard that prior to 1970. I'm not saying people weren't talking about it before then. They, they absolutely were. But I never heard it before around 1970. But then again, as the song says, years of time have come and gone since I first heard it told how Jesus would come again someday if back then it seemed so real then I just can't help but feel how much closer his coming is today so that song was looking forward to the return of the Lord Jesus and in so doing it is a song of joy and we started the service this morning after the doxology with which we should sing praise the Lord on Sunday morning but with the song joy to the world joy to the world the lord has come our world our nation our society our state our city our county our church our hearts all need joy and i see looking around today a, a great deal of people just don't seem to have any joy and it is so needed it is so needed can i share something with you Anybody can get depressed. And I'm not telling you if you're going through depression, I'm not telling you it's, it's nothing. You just change your mind and that, that'll be the end of it. It's, generally speaking, it's not that simple. Anybody can get depressed. And sometimes circumstances are depressing. And I'm not here to give you an, an analysis or anything like that, but I am going to tell you if you are in a state of depression and anybody can get there, some of the most greatest people of faith of all history have been in states of depression. So if that is where you are today, understand that you need to begin. There's, this isn't going to solve all your problems, but you need to begin by making a decision that you're not going to stay that way. Now, you may need help getting out of it. It's not so simple as say, well, I'll just, I just won't be depressed anymore. It's not that simple. But you have to start somewhere. And I'm telling you, that's a good place to start. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines joy as the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what we desire. A state of happiness the prospect of possessing what we desire in other words you there is something you desire something you want something you've been longing for and now you have a prospect that you're going to get it I told you about the church the Koryama Baptist Church in Koryama Japan they've been for a couple of years now desiring a pastor and now they have the prospect that that desire may be fulfilled 
That has to bring joy. But there is a point where we have to understand that joy is not something that just delights us all the time. You know, it's, it's not like sitting down and watching some comedy movie or something like that and just makes you laugh and laugh. Uh, you know, there are certain things that make me laugh, and I enjoy things that make me laugh. But the, the fact of the matter is, it's, it's not just about laughing all the time. It's talking about being in a state of mind and a state of happiness in your mind. So there may be different things that bring joy to different people, and that's normal. I was talking to a group of teenagers just last Tuesday night and we're talking about being different. I mean, we're all different, and we're supposed to all be different. And I've said this here many times. I said it to the teenagers Tuesday night, uh, not here in, in another city. And um, I was talking to them, and I said, you know, I'm thankful that we're all different. Different today has become like a bad word. You can't say anybody's different because that's insulting. It's not insulting. It's just a fact. We're all different. If we weren't all different, how would you tell who was who? I mean, think about it. If we were all the same, we wouldn't. How'd you identify each other? Well, we'd we'd take fingerprints. Well, that wouldn't work if we were all the same, would it? You, you see what I'm saying? So, different things bring joy to different people. What brings joy to you may not bring much joy to me, and and the reverse of that is true. But most of the time, joy is temporary. Something brings us joy and it makes us happy for right now, but it doesn't last. Now, God knows that and he knows how we're made. But the Lord Jesus said that we can have fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. That means you can just be filled, absolutely filled with joy. Now, again, that doesn't mean you're going to be laughing all the time. But it means you can have that joy and contentment that you need to have. And through that joy and contentment, you're going to have peace. So 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, we find the source of this fullness of joy. So look at it with me, if you will. Look at the first verse. The first phrase of the first verse is, That which was from the beginning. That which was from the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of John's story? No. The beginning of John walking with the Lord Jesus? No. The beginning of everything. The, that which was from the beginning. Genesis 1.1, the first verse of the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. John, written by the same author, John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. Word is capitalized there. And the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. Verse 2 says the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. All things and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made. That was made. So both of those verses written two millennia apart, both of those verses are talking about the same thing. The beginning of what? The beginning of creation. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 is talking about the same beginning. He says, that which was from the beginning, that which was before there was time, before there was a universe, Certainly before there was a planet Earth or human beings, before any of that, that beginning, that which was from the beginnings, what was there in the beginning? In the beginning, Genesis 1-1 tells us, God. So this is what it's talking about, the time when God was there before we had anything else that we even know about or could relate to. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Now think about the sentence structure there. We have heard. We have heard what? You've heard that which was from the beginning. You heard something that was there before anything else existed. That's exactly what he's saying. How can you hear something 
that was there in your lifetime before the universe existed. It's a powerful thought. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. You know what he's saying? He's saying he was here. Who was here? The Creator. He was here. And he's saying he was here and we heard him. We heard him speaking. And not only did we hear him, we saw him. There's, there's a verse in the book of Acts that's speaking about the Apostle Paul where it says he was hearing a voice but seeing no man. Well, that's not what John's saying here. He's not saying we heard a voice but we didn't see anybody. He said we've heard him and we saw him. And then he says we looked upon him. You know what that means? It means we watched him. We observed him. We were with him day after day, night after night. We were there with him. We heard him. We saw him. We watched him. We observed him. And then it says our hands have handled. We touched him. This wasn't a spirit. This was flesh and bones. This wasn't something of the imagination. This wasn't something that, that they had a, a hallucination about. He was materially here. He was here. Notice the verse again, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Let me take you back in your thinking to John, Gospel of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 1, verse 2 again, the same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now let's skip all the way down to verse 14 of that same chapter. Not that the verses in between aren't important, they are. But for sake of time, skip down to the 14th verse where it says this. And the Word, capitalized, the Word that was with God, the Word that was God, the Word by whom all things were made, the Word was made flesh, just like this, and dwelt among us, lived among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We, John's referring to himself and the other apostles, we were with Him. We walked with him. We sat and listened to him. We ate with him. We saw him feed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. On another occasion, we saw him feed 4,000 people. We saw him turn water into wine. We saw him calm the storm with his word. We saw him heal the sick. We caused him give sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf to cause the lame to walk. And we even saw him raise the dead. Then, then we saw him die. How could he who is life, who has life in him, how can he who is the creator of all things, how can he who raised the dead die? But he did. Philippians chapter 2 tells us the reason for that is that God came in human form for the express purpose that he could die. So that he could take the wages of sin, which belongs to us. The wages of sin is death, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. He could take that upon himself. Because God, who is eternal, cannot die. But God, in a human body, that human body can die. And he did. A little boy asked me the other day, he said, how, how, if Jesus is God, how did Jesus die? It's a good question. Good question. Shows he's thinking. Say, so what did you tell him? Here's what I told him. I said, if you go to John chapter 10, you're going to read where Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. That's how. So he laid aside that human body. The Spirit of God did not die ever. 
but he laid aside that human body for a period of approximately three days. Because John is saying, we saw him. We were with him. We walked with him. He talked with us. We spent all that time with him. And then we saw him die. But three days later, we saw him alive again. And again, he walked with us and he talked with us. He taught us and we ate with him on more than one occasion. And for the next 40 days, he showed himself alive, as Luke says in Acts chapter 1, by many infallible proofs, evidence that cannot be denied. Wasn't just seen in a few remote places by one or two people. He was seen by groups of people repeatedly for a month and 10 days. Then, John says, we saw him return to heaven. And in Acts chapter 1, it says that he, when he had finished talking to them, he ascended up into heaven. A cloud received him out of the sight, out of their sight. And two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus, whom you have seen go into the heavens, shall so come as you have seen him go. In like manner, he will, he will come again. Now that's <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. You get over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and it tells us that he's coming with clouds. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Heaven is not a cloud. God is not a cloud. But God used clouds, and God does use clouds to do pretty amazing things in the Bible. You read about it. It's an interesting study. Maybe one day we'll... We'll take time to go through all of that. Now, that's just verse one of these four verses that I want to share with you. <clears throat> Let's read verse one again so we get the flow of thought and we'll go to verse two. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested. The life was manifest. Manifested means made visible. I want you to think about something for a minute. Have you ever seen life? Well, sure, I've seen life. What are you talking about? I see. I look all around me. There's life all around me, and 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 you see plant life, and you see animal life, and you see human life. You see. No, you see things that are alive. Do you actually see life? And I'm going to submit to you: you don't actually see life. You see the result of life. You see things that are alive. The life is inside. You don't see the life itself. The truth of the matter is, when the spirit leaves the body, the body then is what? Dead. That's the end of it. But you don't see that spirit. What are you trying to say? Are you trying to get spooky on us here? Not at all. What I'm trying to do, I'm trying to help you understand, we don't see life. We see life the evidence of life through plants and animals and people. And I'm thankful that we do. But here's what he's saying in verse 2. The life was manifested. We saw the life. Again, going back to John, Gospel of John chapter 1, it says there, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. You're going to see similar language here. For the life was manifested and we have seen it. We have seen that which is eternal, that which was from the beginning. Life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested, again, made visible unto us. We've seen it. We're here to bear witness. We're here to tell you what we have seen and what we have heard. We're here because we are eyewitnesses. Let me ask you a question. Don't raise your hand or speak out. Just think about this. Have you ever thought you'd like to go back in history and see something, some historical event that happened? I, I tell you, my family and I, uh, we all are interested in history. And whenever we take a vacation, which is not very often, but whenever we do, we try to schedule into that vacation a visit to at least one historical site. 
Why? I just, we love going to historical sites. Think about it. Some place that you've read about, you've heard about, uh, maybe you learned about it in school, but now you're there. You're there where those things actually happen. And you can better relate to it, better understand that historical event by being in the place where it happened. So you ever wanted to do that? Go back, travel back in time and, and talk to people and see things firsthand as they happen? I don't know if you have. I, I want to do that. Have you ever done? Of course not. Nor do I ever expect to be able to. Well, what's the next best thing to that? Next best thing to that is talk to somebody who was there. I'll, give you, I, I'll keep this story short, but I think it'll help you relate. Back in the mid-1970s, and I mentioned that earlier, I was living in the little town of Dayton, Tennessee. I actually didn't live in town. I lived on the mountain up above the town. I was living in the vicinity of Dayton, Tennessee. In the 1920s, they had a court case in that little town that made history, and for the United States at least, changed history. And it was called the Scopes Trial because a man named John Scopes was on trial for teaching evolution in the public schools. What do you mean he was on trial? At that time, it was against Tennessee state law for him to do that. Now, a lot of people will talk to you about that and there have been books written about it and movies made about it and documentaries produced about it and all kinds of things. And what you're gonna find if you read the different books and watch the different movies and documentaries, you're gonna get different points of view. Who was right and who was wrong and, and what was right about it and what was wrong about it and who won and who lost. I, I could tell you who won the case, but that's, that's not the point I'm trying to make here. I wasn't there in the 1920s. I know some of you probably think I was, but I wasn't. But I got the next best thing. When I lived there, I got to talk to people who were there. They were eyewitnesses. The one man was the town barber. It's a small town. He was also pastor of the Methodist church there. Another man I talked to ran a hardware store in town, and he had been running it. This is the 1970s, understand. He had been running that hardware store since the 1920s. I talked to people who were there approximately 50 years later, but they had been there and got firsthand information, not just studying and researching, going online or digging through books or any of that, talking to people who were there. Now that's, that's pretty good when you get the account of what happened from the people who were actually there. So where are you going with this? Right here, what we're reading here in these first four verses of 1 John is the account of somebody, not just one person, at least 12 men who were there. And this is an eyewitness account. So again, verse 2, the life was manifested, made visible, we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Visible. We saw that eternal life. And we're here to show you eternal life. John is writing this so that you'll know. If you read the Gospel of John, and you may ever wonder what was his point in writing this book, you don't have to wonder because he tells you right in this book. He said that he wrote this book so that you would believe in Jesus Christ. That's exactly, and that believing you would have life through his name. That's why the Gospel of John was written. Well, can I help you with something? The book of 1 John has a similar purpose. 1 John is really addressed to people who have already believed in Jesus, although if you haven't believed in Jesus yet, you can still read that book and get a lot out of it. But it's written to young believers, people who had trusted Jesus as their Savior, but they weren't very far along in their Christian growth. And it's an instruction book to help them get started in the Christian life. But again, who better to tell us about it than somebody who was there? Now go to verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we were eyewitnesses. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. 
Now, first of all, so that you would believe, but not only so that you believe, we declared unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. Now, to be sure, when John wrote this, he was writing to people who were contemporaries of his. They were living at the time, and he wanted them to have fellowship with us, us being himself and the other apostles. <clears throat> but here we are 2,000 years later reading it. Can we have fellowship with John and the other apostles? Well, not directly, no. They're in eternity. We're still living in time. But we can gather together in one point. Let me kind of share this with you, and, and maybe it'll help you understand what I'm about to say. <clears throat> when my wife and I were, were dating, and um, we were apart a good deal of the time, separated by about a 1,000 miles, and so we didn't have the Internet or email or any of that. We didn't have cell phones. So here's what we do. I would write her a letter every day. I did. I wrote her a letter every day. And then once a week when I got paid, uh, and I would take my paycheck and cash it, and at the bank I'd get a roll of quarters, and I'd go to the pay phone and call her. You had to use a pay phone? Yeah, I had to use a pay phone. I didn't have my own phone. And I'd call her. But here's something else we did. We made an appointment. We made an appointment that at 10 p.m. every night, we would both go to prayer. And we'd pray for each other. We were separated physically by a thousand miles, but I said, you know what? I'll meet you at the throne of God. And so we had an appointment 10 p.m. every night to pray. Say, well, you weren't actually together. Well, no, we weren't actually together, but we we're together through the Lord. And that's what John is telling us here. We can't go and actually physically fellowship and be with the apostles, but we can actually fellowship with the Lord. And he connects us all. So again, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father. And that's what I was getting at. Our fellowship is with the Father. And because we fellowship with Him and you fellowship with Him, then we have unity. Our fellowship was with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The Father, the Creator and King of the universe, everything that we know about, the Giver of life, the Judge of all the universe. Pastor Chris teaching this morning about the judgment seat of Christ, the Judge of all the universe. And John's saying, we want you to have fellowship with Him. And you can. I talked about praying, my wife and I making, of course we weren't married at the time, but making an appointment to pray at the same time. But any time you go to the Lord in prayer, you can fellowship with Him. And I'm going to tell you, if you read His Word, He'll speak to you through the Word. You're not likely to hear an audible voice. It isn't going to be like that. But you're going to be reading and you ask the Lord to speak to you and He'll give you things through the Word. You'll see it. But you talk to Him through prayer. And in that light, you can have conversations with God. You talk to him in prayer, he'll speak to you through the word. So God wants you to know him. He wants you to love him. And he wants you to serve him. And John says, we want you to have fellowship with God, the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. Get to know Jesus. Get to know him better. When I was a little boy, I went to Sunday school some, not regularly, like I should have, <clears throat> but I did some, and I went there, and they, they used in those days what they call quarterlies. And it was a little book that had lessons in it for a quarter of the year. And so you would study that. And this little quarterly Sunday school book was had a yellow cover on it. It was bright yellow cover, color, and um, paperback, of course. But the name of the little quarterly was, What is God Like? What is God Like? 
So I read that little quarterly, whether I went to Sunday school that week or not, I read the little quarterly. And I said, what is God like? And you know what it said? It said, God is like Jesus. If you want to know God, get to know Jesus and you will know God. That's a pretty simple statement, but it's very profound. Do you want to know God? Get to know Jesus. Get to know Jesus. And after all these years as I study the Gospels and I read more about him, my favorite part of the Bible is the Gospels. So don't you read the rest of the Bible? Well, yes. But the, my favorite part is the Gospels because that's where Jesus is speaking, where you see Jesus acting. And you get to know Jesus. So verse 4, he says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. That your joy, your hope, your deepest desire, your state of well-being, and your happiness may be full. Now, it doesn't mean that nothing bad is ever going to happen to you doesn't mean that at all. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise you that if you love God with all your heart and serve him with all your heart, nothing that bad is ever going to come into your life. It doesn't say that at all. Matter of fact, it pretty much says the opposite. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. That's a promise. In this world, you're going to have trouble. Then he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The thing about Romans 8.28 Verses quoted often and with good reason. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And let me tell you what that verse does not say. It does not say everything that happens in your life is going to be good. Not what it says. It says all things work together for good. Even the bad things that happen in your life, the trouble that comes into your life can be used to work together for good, to bring you to a good point. But then that's still not all that it says. It says all things work together for good, but doesn't say for everybody. It says all things work together for good for them that love God. That promise isn't made to everybody. It's made to those who love God. To them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose, his will, his plan, his plan for your life. God has a plan for my life. Count on it. Absolutely. I think one of the saddest truths in, in, in all the world is this, that most people don't ever stop to think about what God's plan for their life might be. They have their own plan for their life, and that's what they're concerned about, and that's what they're going to pursue is their plan and what they want to do. And they never even stop to think, does God have a plan for me? Is there something God wants me to do? And they miss it. They miss it altogether. My friends, you don't have to miss it. You don't. You come to the Lord and you, you say like the Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus when he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do? And then when you get the answer, do it. Now, let me tell you how the answer is not probably going to come. You're not probably going to see the skies open up and a big booming voice lay out the plan for you for the rest of your life. That's probably not going to happen. How'd it happen with Saul of Tarsus? I'll tell you how it happened. He is on the road and he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord said, go into town and somebody will tell you what to do next. That's it. That's it. That's all he told him. Go into town, somebody will meet you there and tell you what to do next. So what did he do? He went into town, somebody met him there and told him what to do next. What did he tell him to do? He told him to get baptized. Well, what did he do after that? He started preaching and teaching. What did he do after that? Spent the rest of his life preaching and teaching and writing. But if God had come to him at that point and said, Look, Saul, here's, here's what I got for you. Okay? You have been the great persecutor of the church. You have been the enemy of my people. But starting today, here's what's happening. You've seen me now. You, you believe in me now. And that's great. That's what you need to do. You trusting me now. Wonderful. You're born again. 
So here's what we're, here's what my plan is for you. First of all, we're going to change your name. You're not going to be Saul anymore. You're going to be called Paul. Secondly, you're going to write half of, of this new set of scriptures we call the New Testament. And it's, it's going to be my word and it's going to go into all the world. And it, people are going to be reading it thousands of years from now. And then you're going to travel all over Asia Minor. And you and, and a couple of other fellows are going to start churches all over the place. And then uh, they're going to arrest you and persecute you, and eventually they're going to chop off your head. Now, if you were he and God told you all that, what would you say? Yeah, exactly. Can't do it. Can't do it. So the Lord doesn't tell you all that all at once. He told him to do what? Get up and go into town. You'll be told what to do next. You know what you do? You go one step at a time one day at a time, and you keep doing what God tells you to do today, and you won't have to find the will of God because you'll already be in it. You'll be doing it. So, that joy, that hope, that deep desire, your state of well-being, happiness, can be full because you know that you're walking God's will. Again, that's not saying no no trouble's coming. No problems are going to happen. Nothing bad's going to happen. You're never going to suffer any loss. Doesn't say that. God says, I'll be with you. It is God's will for you to have joy. It is. First, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15 and verse 11, Jesus said, These things uh, have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to be full of joy. Again, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. What is John 15 all about? Well, it's about fruit bearing and living a fruitful life, life of service. Next chapter, John chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus says, Hitherto, now, that's a word we don't use much anymore, hitherto. What does it mean? It means up unto now, up to this point. Hitherto or up to this point, have you asked nothing in my name? Ask, and you shall receive that your joy may be full. I said something about this last Sunday, I think, but I'm only saying it again because I want to show you something about John 16, 24. There have been times, a number of times, not just one or two, where people have asked me to come and have a prayer at some event, and they, they say something like this, Reverend, we want you to pray, but could you possibly not mention Jesus? And I, I've found different ways to deal with that, but what I've wanted to say is, so you really don't want me to pray? Well, no, no, we, we want you to pray. I said, well, I have a promise that if I pray in Jesus' name, he's going to hear and answer my prayer. But you don't want me to mention Jesus, so you really don't want me to pray. I, that seems that way to me. Now, I've never done this. I've never done this, but I've been tempted to do it. Anybody else ever have a temptation? Okay, nobody else. I'm the only one. Okay, all right. I've been tempted to do it. I've been tempted to go to one of these events where they want you to pray, but they don't want you to mention Jesus. And just when it comes time to stand up there and say, well, may the force be with you. <laughs> I mean, if I'm not going to pray, <laughs> might as well say that. Say, well, that doesn't help them at all. It sure doesn't. It sure doesn't. No, when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. And why? He told us to. Hitherto, up till now, have you asked nothing in my name? Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. You know, you start praying for things, and you start keeping track of what you pray for and the answers to prayer that you have, and your joy level is going to go way up. It is. And you may not be asking things for yourself. I'm, I'm not saying, uh, like I, I saw, I shared this with the men last night, uh, saw a, I guess you call it a meme on the internet where it showed this well-known preacher who preaches the prosperity gospel, you know, uh, you name it and claim it's yours, that kind of thing. And 
I'm sure the man didn't actually say this. This was somebody making making a joke. But they have the fella in this meme saying, the lesson we learn from the story of Noah and the ark is that God wants you to have a yacht. Yeah, that's not what it means at all. <laughs> not what it means at all. So the truth of the matter is, it's not ask, going and saying, Lord, give me a, a yacht. I, I need a yacht. Lord, I want you to give me a yacht. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about that. I personally have never asked God for a yacht, and I'm pretty sure I never will because I don't know what I'd do with it if I had it. But hitherto, I know somebody's saying, well, you give it to me. <laughs> but hitherto, up until now, have you asked nothing in my name? Ask, and ye shall receive. Why? That your joy may be full. You know, God wants to hear your prayers. And he wants to answer your prayers. Well, yeah, I don't know about that, preacher. I prayed for something that didn't happen. I believe that. Sure. Well, why is that? There could be a number of reasons why. And I'd, we'd have to talk for a while to try to figure it out. And then we might not figure it out. But it's not because God doesn't hear you. It's not because He doesn't care about you. It's not because He doesn't want to answer your prayer. Well, what could be possible reasons? Well, it could be that you've got some sin in your life and that's blocking your, your communication line a little bit, causing some static there. It could be because sin separates us from God. But it could be that what you're asking for isn't what God really knows is best for you. And I've seen that in my life. I've seen it where I prayed for a certain thing, didn't get it. But when I didn't get it, I wasn't happy that I didn't get it. But later, it turned out for the best. If I had gotten what I asked for, things wouldn't have gone too well. Then James says, sometimes you don't get your prayers answered because you asked for the wrong thing. It says, you ask and you have not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. You ask God to give you something wrong, something you know is not right, and, and you generally think God's going to give that to you. Why should he? Why should he? So ask and pray in Jesus' name. And saying Jesus' name is not a magic formula. It's not that. But Dr. John Rice in his book on prayer said this. He said it's, it's kind of like having his signature on the check. Now, we don't write checks too much anymore, but I think most of you still know what I'm talking about. Up until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. The Lord Jesus wants you to have joy. He wants you to have it fully. But you cannot have the joy of the Lord until you know the Lord. I've said many times that I was never an atheist, and I wasn't. There was never been a day in my life when I didn't believe that there was a God who existed. There were years in my life when I didn't know God. Did I believe there was a God? Yes. Did I know Him? Not at all. Before I came to know God, to be more specific, if I had died, I would have gone to hell. There's no doubt about it. Matter of fact, I was fully aware of that. I was. I was fully aware that the direction my life was going, that was where it was leading. And I didn't expect my life to last much longer because of the direction it was going. And had God not intervened, I'm quite sure I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. What had happened? My sins had separated me from God. But as John Newton wrote, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I did not have the joy that God wanted me to have because of my sin. The things that I had done wrong formed a barrier between my soul and my God. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, or as Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, I was dead in trespasses and sins. I walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works disobedience in the children of disobedience. I was a child of disobedience. No question about that. Among whom, children of disobedience, I also had my conversation, my daily 
lifestyle, my daily living, in times past of the lust of the flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, and was by nature the child of wrath, even as others. But God, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and raised us up together to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. So when the Lord saved my soul and forgave my sin and granted me eternal life, then I came to have joy. And as I follow him and, and stay close to him, then he continues to give me joy. So the joy of the Lord is knowing certain things. It's knowing that he loves you. The joy of the Lord is knowing that although you have sinned and grieved his heart, He's paid for your account in full. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. When you trust that he paid for your sins on the cross and you trust him to save your soul, he's promised to do it. Then if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes under righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When you realize how much the Lord God loves you and you trust him to forgive your sins, save you from your sins, and that you understand that the penalty for your sins, eternal condemnation, has been paid, you will know the joy of his forgiveness and you will know the joy of knowing him. And as you get to know him, your joy will be full. When you understand that you can understand the Bible, because you are led by his spirit to guide you into all truth, your joy will be full. When you surrender your will to his and your desire to his to do his will and to follow his word, your joy will be full. And when you help other lost sinners to come to know the Lord Jesus so that they can be saved and have the joy of the Lord, your joy will be full. You cannot have the joy of, that God wants you to have until you place your faith in him. But once you trust him and begin to follow him, then that joy belongs to you. So if you've trusted him to save you, live your life in the joy of the Lord. If you have not trusted him, I plead with you, trust him now. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for loving us when we're not worthy of your love. When we have sinned and gone astray and we're like lost sheep wandering off on our own, not because we had no choice, but because we make the choices. We see right and we choose wrong. Lord, you loved us anyway. You loved us so much that you made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. Him who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Lord, it may be that everybody who's hearing my voice right now has already trusted you as their savior. If that is true, I thank you and praise you. It may be, it may be that there's one or possibly even more than one person who is listening now or someone who will listen later who does not know that their soul is saved, their sins are forgiven, that they have a home in heaven, but they can. If they would open their heart and trust you to forgive their sins, to save their souls, give them everlasting life. Folks, if you've never sinned, if you've never done anything wrong, then you don't need a savior. But the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. So why not admit that you, like all the rest of us, are a sinner and then understand and believe that God still loves you, that Jesus paid for your sins at the cross so that you don't have to. He rose from the grave and he's alive today and ready and willing to give you everlasting life if you'll trust him. Just pray and say, Lord, I, I believe. I believe that though I'm a sinner, you still love me. And Lord, I'm asking you to forgive my sins. I'm asking you to save my soul. I believe that my sins were paid for at the cross. I believe that you're alive today and I'm trusting you right here, right now to forgive me and to save me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, maybe you prayed that prayer with me. Maybe you didn't. You can still call on the Lord and be saved. Recognize that you need to be saved. Recognize that your sins have been paid for and trust him to forgive you. He says he'll do it. You take him at his word. Maybe you're here this morning to say, Preacher, that's not my need. I didn't come here this morning with that need. I came here with other needs. The same God who loves you enough to save you, loves you enough to get you through the situation that you're in right now. You give your heart to him and follow him. If you need prayer, I want you to come. We're going to leave the platform and stand down at the head of the center aisle. God's spoken to your heart this morning about being saved, or maybe you've already been saved, but there's something else on your heart. You need prayer. You need a word of counsel. Maybe there's a spiritual decision you've been needing to make, but you haven't made it. You come. We'll pray with you. We'll help you in any way that we can. Father, bless and move this invitation time. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.